just a couple of uh, points there. Uh, as far as the rates go, we didn't make uh, any move. But I think what you should read in the policy is both our views on the evolution of inflation going forward, as well as uh, focus on Part B, where there's a substantial number of actions that we have taken to facilitate uh, growth and development of the financial sector. So with that as a, as a preamble, uh, I think we are uh, happy to take questions. Yes, I do. Good morning, Governor. Anirudh here from ED now. Uh, so uh, we all know that you don't uh, like to be branded as an inflation warrior, uh, but clearly uh, going by the kind of guidance uh, that you've given and the kind of uh, risks that you've outlined on the 6% inflation target uh, by January 2016, uh, one does seem to get uh, the, the impression that uh, we might not see any uh, kind of easing and possibly a, a cycle of rate hikes if uh, you don't uh, kind of reach that objective by then. So Uh, that you've given and the kind of uh, risks that you've outlined on the 6% inflation target uh, by January 2016, uh, one does seem to get uh, the, the impression that uh, we might not see any uh, kind of easing and possibly a, a cycle of rate hikes if uh, you don't uh, kind of reach that objective by then. So I just I want to understand your views on that. Uh, I don't think you should read that into the policy. Uh, what we have said is that we are currently positioned to reach the 6% by 2016 January, uh, given where the rate, uh, uh, rate is. Now, there are a number of disinflationary uh, forces underway, uh, which we've talked about. The uh, low oil price is, is one of them. The fact that we have a relatively stable exchange rate is another. Uh, and the fact that wages, uh, especially in rural areas, haven't grown as fast uh, as in previous years is another uh, positive factor for inflation. All these will combine to continue the disinflationary process we see uh, reflected, for example, in core inflation. Headline, of course, has been buffeted a little bit by, by food inflation. There are uncertainties still, one of which is how food inflation will evolve over the course of, uh, of next year, but there are also positives. And what we have to see is how this plays out. Now, I know there is some discrepancy between our modeling of inflation, which says that the uh, expected level by 2016 is, is 7%. Of course, those are models. And uh, the inflation stance or the policy stance is taken by all of us, putting our judgment also uh, to work. And our judgment is that uh, given all that we know about what is happening, we feel, and some of it is model plus some subjectivity, that we can still reach 6% by January 2016, given where we, we are. Now, uh, of course, there are uncertainties. And uh, therefore, given our model is saying two th uh, is 7%, we're saying that the risks are still to the upside. Though they've come down since the last uh, policy meeting because the inflation readings have been better, the monsoon has been better, etc. What we end with our, uh, the policy paragraph is that our actions will be uh, based on a projection of inflation. We need to reach 6% by 2016. I think there's broad agreement that that is what we are trying to do. But it will be contingent on incoming data. So as of now, we are reasonably set. As of now, our expectation is we will reach that, that uh, target. But of course, a lot can happen in the world. Uh, oil prices which are low now can go up or they can go even lower. Some people are projecting uh, really low oil prices. Others are projecting a reversion to where they were. Similarly, every other factor is subject to some uncertainty. So we have to see. The policy will be data contingent. What I understood from reading the policy is uh, that it is more difficult to reach the 6% target than the 8% target. And therefore, there could be a requirement of, if not rate cuts, if you have to continue to keep the rates on, uh, on hold to achieve that unless uh, this, uh, whatever risks you uh, this thing uh, matures. S so I wanted to understand this part first. And secondly, what is your view about the real rate of return, uh, real rate, uh, real interest rates when it comes to, uh, as of now, the current uh, uh, interest rate regime? 
Okay. Uh, number one, uh, clearly there is a lot more confidence about reaching the 8% target than the 6% target. 6% uh, target is a harder target. Uh, and it involves a 2% disinflation, at least as far as our projections go, from the uh, beginning of next year to the end of next year. So that's a, that's, that's a fair amount that needs to be done. Um, I don't know what the evolution of policy rates will be. As I said, that will depend on data. Today we think we are appropriately set, and that is why uh, we reiterated, if you look at the words, we reiterated broadly the guidance that we gave in the August policy, but also emphasized that at least the data developments since August have been positive, that the monsoon has been better than expected, and of course oil prices have come down significantly since then. Also, I, I should mention that uh, you know, uh, we continue being fixated about the value of the rupee against the dollar, but if you look at the value of the rupee against all other currencies, a six-country basket or a 36-country basket, the rupee has actually been quite strong. So those are all factors that have played out in the inflationary process. And we have to wait and see how it develops. But uh, I wouldn't read uh, more than one should into the policy statement. We are a little better than we were in August, but we are still not, uh, you know, f uh, there are still risks in achieving the 6% target, we are more confident of achieving the 8% target. Uh, Bijoy, the real rate of? Uh, what real rate is appropriate? I mean, you can't look at other countries and see what real rate is appropriate. I mean, clearly, uh, what we would like to see is uh, more households having confidence in fixed income securities and deposits and returning to financial savings. As you know, financial savings of households have dropped off considerably in the last few years. Some of that is because the tax benefits to financial savings have also come down in real terms, but some of it is also because the real interest rate has not been appropriate. Of course, in looking at the real interest rate, you have to balance the interests of uh, savers as well as, as uh, uh, borrowers, and we'll have to find an appropriate mix. But that, again, is something that we will have to see as data evolves, and we will see credit growth, we will see deposit growth, we will see other sources of finance, how they grow, and may take a view. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, Governor Rajan, uh, two questions. One is you've given a timeline, finally, for the HTM cuts. Um, you finally? Also I thought you used the word finally. Finally, because earlier there was a there was a timeline given that had to be reversed in the earlier tenure. So um, you'll have given a uh, timeline for the HTM reversals. At the same time, you'll have allowed up to seven percent of SLR to be uh, to be factored in uh, under LCR. Does this mean that SLR cuts for, because effectively SLR becomes fifteen percent? That means have you achieved that fifteen percent level that you're intending to achieve with uh, for SLR? And uh, will we then not see any SLR cuts? I love the way you give me goals. I don't know where the uh, <laughs> intent to achieve. I mean, 15% is a number that's, that's out there in the air. Uh, look, the point is over time. Uh, okay, first the rationale for the 5%. Uh, our view is the banks are sitting on plenty of liquid securities. So to put them under more severe constraints uh, through the LCR, when the objective of the LCR is met by their holding sufficient liquid securities, seemed a little bit of a travesty, uh, uh, a misinterpretation of the intent of the, of the policy. And so our intent was to give them the flexibility to count some of that without actually selling those securities down. So SLR holdings achieve many purposes. One is liquidity. Of course, uh, you know, historically it's been a source of government finance. We have said that as the government's finances improve, we will steadily bring SLR down. Now, to what level? That depends. We'll have to take a view. I don't have a view in mind right now. But it will be a measured process. Right now, we want to deal with the problem of LCR, which is kicking in earlier than the evolution of SLR. So given that, there is a special facility we will, we will open. Uh, in, uh, there will be some conditions on when it will open. We'll have to make sure that's consistent with Basel requirements. 
but that will give the banks flexibility to count some of those existing SLR holdings as part of their liquidity coverage, so they don't have to maintain, maintain additional liquidity. That's all. So this is flexibility for the banks. Uh, it doesn't say anything about the overall path of SLR and where that will be. The progress that you should expect is that over time, as government finances improve, SLR will be steadily cut to a level which is consistent with the liquidity needs uh, and the prudential liquidity needs. So just to, uh, an additional question. There have been some legal uh, judgments against the willful default uh, uh, stance that the RBI had, the earlier definition, actually. Um, now you all have come up with some, uh, a norm that indicates non-cooperative. Is this a way of actually ensuring that you know, errant uh, borrowers don't get away? No, uh, uh, I mean, they're, they're tackling two different things. Uh, the willful defaulter is about somebody who has uh, essentially uh, done, um, uh, you know, not used funds for the appropriate purposes. That, that's, that's a crude way of saying it. I don't want to get into the legalese. Uh, there, uh, the court, the Honorable Court, had some questions about whether all directors could be declared willful defaulters, and we've looked at that, and uh, we are in the process of modifying the definition, so that directors should be uh, seen as culpable in, in the sense of actively uh, participating or being grossly negligent in uh, the willful default to be part of that willful default list. So we are modifying that to deal with the concerns of the court, which obviously we have to respect. Uh, going to non-cooperative defaulter, it's trying to tackle a different issue, which is there are some borrowers. There are some borrowers uh, who basically resist repaying at every corner, uh, holding up the process. And our sense is whatever the their recourse to legal processes, which is uh, um, you know allowable by the laws of the land, uh, from a prudential perspective they impose a cost to the system because banks cannot get their money using the existing laws such as surface. And therefore, in those situations where there is a deliberate attempt to delay and, uh, uh, and inhibit the process of recovery after you know, due process has been followed, can we find a way of declaring these borrowers as non-cooperative? This is not a legal definition. It is a regulatory definition which will mean that higher uh, capital, higher provisioning will be required in further lending to these borrowers. So it's a purely regulatory structure, but which will increase the cost precisely because there are prudential, there are prudential risk. Finally. Okay, uh, Governor, I probably uh, am repeating the question, but I wanted more color on this. Uh, you say that the future policy stance will be influenced by the Reserve Bank's projection of inflation. Uh, relative to its median of objective. Your projection is 7% by the fourth quarter of 1516, but your objective is 6%, and this will guide your policy stance. How should we understand that? Should we understand that you will have to therefore act more to get to 6%? Also, therefore, to repeat that question on real policy rates. Well, well, let, let me answer this, then you go to the next question. As, as far as projection goes, you're taking the model projection, and what I was trying to say is, Model projection plus our subjective judgment as to forces the model is not capturing is our actual projection. And so our sense is that the projection, the mean, is around 6%. But the model is saying 7 so it does create a little bit of uncertainty as to uh, whether we should put a lot of, how much weight we should put on our subjective uh, addition to the model. So our sense is the risks are to the upside, which we've said. Those risks, which were to the upside also in the August uh, projection, have come down somewhat. Uh, but we're, we're, we're certainly in a, in a situation where we're not saying the risks are to the downside, which we are saying for the short-term projection. So that's, hopefully that clarifies that. Not entirely. Okay. Uh, what I want to therefore know is mm -hmm. that if the, uh, mo the projection comes, as you say, along with the model, you add your subjective observations, and it indeed looks like the trajectory is towards your projected yeah. 7%. Uh, uh, what will the stance model be? Model projected 7%. Yes, now you're getting the model to projected 7%. Yeah. What will your stance be? Will it mean you will have to do more work? Uh, Either way, I mean, I've said uh, if uh, the data come in and say that we're going to miss the 6%, 
we will have to uh, tighten. If the data come in and say we will do better than the 6% or earlier than January, we will have room to be more accommodative. We, what I'm saying is we are currently appropriately positioned, but the data could come in either way. Okay, I tried to tie in the real rate primarily because okay, of that. Are question. we now appropriately positioned in terms of real interest rates, uh, which is why you don't want to tinker with it? Therefore, uh, if the uh, projected rate of 7% happens, what would be the real uh, uh, interest rates that you will be comfortable with? If you wanted to come to 6, would it be a different real interest rate? Uh, if we have already arrived at 6, would it be a different real interest rate? I, I'm not picking a real interest rate out of, out of a hack. Uh, I want to see the evolution of credit, the evolution of activity, the evolution of deposits to uh, determine where we feel comfortable. Remember, the real rate, as, as you well know, is, is composed of the nominal rate, uh, policy rates which we set, uh, plus whatever uh, other credit uh, spreads and inflation spreads that people uh, and, uh, and other spreads people put in, liquidity spreads and so on, minus inflation, right? And what is happening is inflation is coming down. So even without us changing the policy rate, to some extent the real rate has been widening over the last few months. From being strongly negative, it has become somewhat positive. We haven't seen a big response in financial savings thus far as a result of the rate becoming positive, partly perhaps because inflationary expectations have yet to adjust to the changes in inflation. Over time, that will happen. So the expected real rate, which is the nominal rate minus the, uh, the expectations of inflation, will then become positive. I think it's too early to say that the expected real rate is already positive right now. That will reflect in savings behavior. I don't know how fast that will move, etc. Also, we have to look at credit and the credit uh, offtake, how that moves. So there are some uncertainties in this process, which is why I don't want to, to lock into a particular real rate. Then you have to tell me whether it's the real rate which is today or it's the expected real rate. Or with, uh, I mean, uh, there are lots of uh, ambiguities there. Is there normally in your mind an appropriate real interest rate for a country like ours? No. I don't know what that is. I, I have to see how the various, uh, you know, uh, aspects that we're worried about, uh, investment, savings, uh, credit, how all those move to get a sense of what I'm comfortable with. The world has changed a lot in the last few years, right? So uh, a few uh, you know, months ago, they were saying that the appropriate real rate in the U.S. was negative 6%, right? Uh, now, given if the real rate in the U.S. is negative 6% or let's say even zero, what is the appropriate rate in India? I, I don't know. I need to see how all these variables move, uh, and I, I think we'll be very pragmatic about it uh, and not locked into a view that the theoretical real rate is X. Usually people look at uh, you know, uh, uh, some some factor of growth and so on to, to determine that. I, I think we'll be a little more pragmatic. Uh, let's go to the next question. Govardhan. So you mentioned about uh, the interest rates in the U.S. outlook and how it's going. One aspect is that we have been talking about inflation in India, but there is a feeling that the rates in the West and the U.S. is going to go up. How does that affect your stance, and what will be your stance on interest rates if uh, the global interest rates go up? How would you respond? Uh, I think that uh, how the U.S. Uh, US interest rates, indeed other systemic central banks also, I mean, euro may go the other way. So, uh, you know, there is not one single uh, international rate, so to speak. But if you look at that composite, uh, if that is likely to go up, uh, in some ways, that does constrain our elbow room to the extent that we are highly integrated with the global capital markets. And therefore, that's a, that's a variable that we do need to keep in mind. But that would not inform uh, fundamentally uh, uh, our interest rate uh, uh, policy because that is geared towards the inflation objectives. So this is Dinesh from First Post News website. 
Just want to know, how do you anticipate the additional risks on inflation because of this uh, possible high prices on energy, in the, uh, energy fuel prices? The Supreme Court has canceled the majority of the coal blocks which they have allotted. On the other hand, there is the revised gas pricing formula being worked out. So some expect, you know, the fuel prices are headed upwards. So have you factored in, have you th given a thought on this uh, impact on overall inflation? That's first question. Can I? Yeah. One, yeah, one more. You know, on one hand, you are fighting hard to contain the bad loan scenario in the banking system. You have a roadmap. On the other hand, you know, uh, two factors probably, you know, which is new since your last policy. One, again, this call block cancellation. So a chunk of uh, loans have already gone into the development of call blocks. That is one. And second is uh, the Jantan Yojana, this uh, government's account opening program. About one and a half trillion worth of loan are uh, expected to be given through the overdraft facility, if I go by the reports. So, uh, you know, the government itself expects, you know, bad loans coming out of this because given the uh, not so good uh, KYC compliance in opening these accounts, they are accept there is no uniform document documentation in opening these accounts. So what could be the, you know, this give, does this give you additional concern, you know, on the, uh, as, you, as you fight inflation? Thanks. Let me, um, let me take the first half of that uh, long question, which is on energy prices. Um, uh, the, what we need to remember is that we are already importing a fair bit of coal from abroad uh, for our power stations. I think the coal price, your question related to what would happen to electricity price. Uh, so there is already an imported element in it. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, imported coal prices have also softened. Uh, as part of the global commodity, uh, you know, compared to uh, uh, compared to some time back. So while that could have some effect, uh, it remains to be seen uh, how much of the substitution will take place. And of course, the sector itself is dynamic. I mean, there is production increases by other coal companies where the where the allocations have been deemed legal. So it's it's not it's not a static thing. Um, uh, secondly, uh, the electricity price is a regulated price. So that would, that would depend on when these electricity price increases filter in through the system, and there may not be a one-for-one -one, uh, relationship uh, at every point in time. So, uh, so one is not terribly worried about this as, as impacting uh, overall inflation, at least from my reading of it, but, uh, you know, it remains to be seen as we go forward. Um, I guess the second question was... Uh, on, the, on the bad loan front, you know. Well, the, then there was a third question on Jandhan Yojana. Uh, well, uh, uh, on, the, on the bad loan front, uh, let me just say that it is uh, an issue we are following very closely, that, uh, you know, while uh, the size of the stressed assets in the system is large, I think if we uh, take action to put the stressed assets back on track, that is the best way, the fastest way we can bring them down. And our entire pressure on the banks has been deal with the problem today. Don't postpone it to tomorrow, because tomorrow it's worse. Uh, the, um, you know, the coal issue will have to be worked out. Let us see what the plans the government brings into play. Uh, of course, a significant attempt to address the fundamental weaknesses in that sector and to get coal, coal uh, sort of flowing again, uh, um, you know, consistent with the high reserves that we have, could be the silver lining in this whole issue, that we deal with the problem once and for all with major uh, uh, reforms in the coal sector, which then uh, make coal more available uh, to, the, to the country for the growing needs. Uh, but we have to see how the legacy of the past is dealt with. Uh, I think the, uh, whatever solutions emerge will uh, require, in a sense, compensation for some of the assets that are on the ground, and thereby some compensation to the banks who have lent against those assets. But let us see how it, how it emerges. Um, on Jandhan Yojana, our main uh, uh, sort of um, uh, we welcome the Jantan Yojana. It's, uh, it's uh, part of the RBI's uh, plan to get universal access. 
There are many ways it can be done, and some of the new institutions which we've announced in this, uh, that we're getting to closure on this policy, payment banks, small finance banks, uh, will be vehicles towards that, uh, towards that aim. Uh, what we've been saying again and again, I'm not as worried uh, about the quality of the KYC. For small accounts, in fact, uh, we have uh, essentially allowed for uh, KYC that can be upgraded over time. Uh, and, uh, in fact, uh, we've been quite liberal on KYC. What I'm more concerned about is that we actually achieve proper inclusion by bringing in households that were not reached in the past, and we bring them in along with things like unique ID and so on, so that the process of direct benefit transfer, which in a sense is the broader goal, uh, can be achieved through these kinds of accounts. So let's keep the broader uh, aim in mind and work towards achieving universal access, and we're working with the government to try and make this, uh, uh, you know, this dream a possibility. Thank you. Hi, Governor Simran here from ET Now. I have a follow-up question. So bankers, uh, we spoke to a couple of bankers after the coal verdict. So they have been saying they might approach the regulator for restructuring of some of the accounts that have been affected by the coal verdict, especially the small accounts. They're not really worried about the large ones. So will you allow some amount of flexibility or any kind of restructuring going forward to these companies which could get affected badly? I think there is a fair amount of flexibility already built into our approach, and uh, I think it would be premature to judge questions of flexibility. But I will uh, reiterate, I mean, whenever we have uh, um, issues of flexibility coming up, uh, the real issue is putting the asset back on track, on recovering your loan, etc. Uh, it's not about postponing recognition of the problem. And let's keep that in mind, that uh, ultimately these problems don't go away. They have to be recognized. Uh, and uh, let's focus on that, that uh, the real issue is to put the real asset back on the ground to make it income generating so that loans can be repaid. Um, we'll check if there are questions from outside Inba. Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question, you may press star and one on your touchstone telephone. Participants in the audio bridge, if you wish to ask a question, you may press star and one. We have a question from Manju of DNA. Please go ahead. Good morning, Governor. I just wanted to ask you, how is the joint lending forum uh, that banks have set up working out, and is it bringing down the pile of uh, bad debts as banks are collectively dealing with the early warning signals? Uh, let me ask my Deputy Governor. Uh, Mr. Mundra to speak about the Joint Lending Forum, and then Mr. Gandhi, if he has uh, anything to add. Yeah, Manju, uh, from the introduction of the system, as you know, for the first three months, it was more on a, a kind of pilot basis, and uh, then it has progressed further. But in terms of the total number of accounts, which are reported on the forum, and the number which was there in January and amount, and when we compare with what is reported in recent month, there is uh, a reduction in number as well as in amount. Okay. As well as in amount. And uh, of course, the reporting is only the initial part of it. Then it has to be followed by the formation of uh, JLF and the uh, related action on that. And I think all the cases which are reported uh, those actions are being undertaken. So I think the system is setting down quite well. Uh, that is what the general impression we may get from it. And one more question I had on the, uh, how much of uh, bank finance is locked up in the company or project that uh, uh, project was full with the cancel? We have that. We are able to collect that information. That should be coming in the in due time. Sorry? We are able to collect that information. It will be coming because banks will be reporting once they recognize it as a uh, SMA 1 or 2, it will be coming. So uh, that, that time only we will be able to tell. I have one last question. Uh, Arbe holds about $73 billion of uh, US Treasury bills. If in case the US uh, interest rates were to move up, what would be the impact on the domestic liquidity, Governor? 
I, I don't know if there's, a direct, if there's a direct impact on domestic liquidity. It just means that mark the market. we'll have to mark the market, exactly. So, um, I mean, whether the uh, – see, in, in recent weeks, what has been happening is the dollar has been appreciating against other currencies. Therefore, when we look at our reserves in dollar terms, they've been coming down. Now, some newspapers make a lot of uh, noise about we, uh, you know, it's coming down because we're selling dollars. I think the bulk of the action has been a revaluation of our foreign exchange reserves rather than any actions we're taking in the market. So similarly, if interest rates move up, we'll have to revalue our reserves based on what the mark-to-market -market value is. So we can't be preaching a different story to banks and then not mark-to-market -market our own assets. So we, we follow best practices there. Thank you. Thanks, Ilma. We'll come back to this room. Two last questions. One, Amol. Yeah, so thank you very much for allowing me to ask a question. Sir, I would like to uh, draw your attention to real estate sector. Like food inflation, you said, inflation, you said. But I want to know whether inflation, uh, real estate prices are a worry for you because banks are really directly associated with, with, with it. Pri uh, demand and supply is a major indicator to the prices. And that is that that drives the economy. But look at the real estate sector. If I am, for example, observing it since last five years, the prices are still stagnant. I mean, it's it, they're just going up and there is no downwards. So... How do you look at that sector specifically? Do you see any change there? Well, it uh, depends on where and how much. But uh, um, leave aside the Aurangzeb roads and the Malabar hills from the calculation, right? Uh, generally, what, what you want to look at is whether real estate prices are increasing faster than uh, um, inflation and at what rate. Now, in a growing economy, you might assume the value of land in real terms is also going to increase. The value of real estate will increase for that reason. But the question is, at what rate? And my sense from looking at the housing data is that uh, broadly, even when you say they aren't coming down, uh, with eight, seven, eight percent inflation, they're coming down in real terms. So they are becoming more affordable because wages are, are going up. At this point, um, as far as credit to the real estate, uh, to uh, buy real estate goes, I'm not overly worried because we do put a pretty hefty discount on the loan to value. Uh, the loan has to be uh, for uh, most houses at least uh, at most 80% of value. Plus, and I'm not uh, uh, crowing about this, but I'm being realistic, there's often a cash component also in these in these purchases, which is pure equity that the buyer has in the in the in the house so to that extent uh, there's a fair amount of cushion below the uh, the bank's loan and so even though loan growth to the real estate sector has been uh, quite strong uh, first it's still a relatively small portion of bank balance sheets and second there's a sufficient equity cushion as of now going forward we'll have to see how the real estate prices uh, evolve and at what point we start getting more concerned. But as of now, I'm not, I'm not overly concerned, barring a few locations where it seems frothy. So just last question. Uh, on Jandhan Yojana, you clarified, but the point is earlier the banks were not, uh, the KYC norms were not there. Now, then the KYC norms came into the picture. Now you're saying that you're giving some relaxation to the KYC norms. For Jandhan Yojana, you don't need any KYC. How actually you're dealing with KYC norms? Because I mean, looking at the growth, of, looking at the population of the country, 50% people still don't have enough documents and they don't still understand the financial language. Now, uh, look, there are a variety of relaxation that were already in place uh, beforehand, right? One was, for example, that you did not have to, and correct me if I'm wrong, would you like to uh, explain the KYC? You, uh, uh, recently, we have clarified that uh, only one document is needed out of the uh, total documents which are uh, listed. All these things are as per the PML uh, rules. So uh, the relaxation now which has come for Jandhan Yojana related to starting the accounting process, account processing. That is a simple declaration with the two photos also. One can start a small uh, savings bank account. That's one they will be able to start. But to graduate into a normal account, then regular KYC procedure will be skipping. Okay. I'll just add to what you were mentioning. One thing is there is a timeline. By then, you know, documentation has to be completed. Till such time, there are restricted transactions. Second part of your question that people are not aware 
you understand the entire financial inclusion program also includes the financial literacy. And that is going on side by side. So as the people are educated in that, they are expected within timeline, there would be a compliance. Uh, one last question from Gambling. Hello, Kevlar Parasini from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, good morning, Governor. Um, we have interviewed, like other colleagues from the press uh, here, uh, economists ahead of this policy meeting, and the response that we got uh, were unanimous on predicting your uh, move today or your absence of thereof. Um, on the other hand, uh, going forward, uh, the consensus uh, is a bit less um, uh, unanimous, if I may say. Uh, so your next move uh, is forecast to happen between uh, the first quarter of next year and the second half of 2016. And also, uh, there's no agreement uh, about the direction because some economists forecast a cut and some economists forecast a hike. Now, um, my question is, are you satisfied with the kind of uh, guidance that you're giving to the market? And also, I have another uh, small question. Um, India, uh, as you pointed out earlier, uh, has been uh, on a category of its own. Um, the rupee has been pretty strong uh, compared to other emerging market peers. Uh, do you think that's, uh, that's part of a new um, uh, scenario that is going gonna, is gonna to be uh, the, the case going forward, that India is just going to be one market on its own? and? Uh, is not going to be associated to, to other peers, uh, as it was the case with the BRIC or the Fragile Five. Thank yeah. you. Um, first question, uh, I think that's, that's appropriate given how much we know. Uh, we are staying away from predicting what the policy, how the policy will evolve going forward because it's going to be data contingent. Uh, and as the incoming data uh, we see the incoming data, our projections will change, both our objective model-based projections and our subjective projections, and we will uh, adapt policy accordingly. Uh, there will be no change in the goal, which is uh, to, to reach that six by, by January of 2016. Um, so I'm not uncomfortable with uh, people on both sides of the spectrum, that does suggest that uh, uh, the uncertainty about the data is on both sides. Uh, some people are fairly confident dis the disinflationary process is well underway and we will see substantial disinflation, and others uh, are more skeptical and, and worry about some, some additional risks. Uh, in recent uh, weeks, the skeptics have been coming down a little bit, but I think they still are there. So that's why you see uh, 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 a variation. Um, on the uh, second question, I mean, uh, you see, one of uh, uh, the dangers in, a, in, in, in uh, I think, economic reporting is we continuously obsess about the rupee-dollar exchange rate. And if you look at the rupee-dollar exchange rate, yesterday the news was the rupee has hit a new seven-month low. Uh, but if you look at any reasonable measure of the rupee against uh, multiple currencies, which is what we should, given we are looking at a trade-weighted uh, basket, uh, in terms of uh, the question that you asked about the rupee strengthening, the rupee has strengthened, uh, precisely because the dollar has strengthened against everybody else. The dollar index is about 6 or 6.5% six stronger than it was at the beginning of the year. And we've broadly held parity with respect to the dollar where we were in the beginning of the year. So we've strengthened along with the dollar. Now, is that something that uh, is 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 that something that we are aiming for, or anything of that sort? We've said repeatedly we are not focused on the level for the exchange rate. What we want to do is reduce undue volatility, and that typically means uh, intervention on both sides. Though, of course, in recent months, with the strengthening of the uh, views on India, especially after the stable government, there's been a lot of money pouring in and many of the views have been one-sided about India. Now, we've taken that opportunity to build some reserves, but going forward, uh, again, uh, we're not, uh, there's no level that we have in mind. Our main objective is to uh, uh, limit volatility when we think it is undue. Uh, 